Good morning. Thanks for joining us, Lisa and Laura. I'm Callum Gallagher. I'm Assistant General Secretary for the Social Workers Union. And I'm here this morning with two of our advice and representation workers who are trade union officials. And we're going to discuss uh, in conversation my part two blog on disability discrimination. So I'm going to hand over to Laura and Lisa to introduce themselves. Laura. Hi, yeah, I'm Laura Sheridan. I'm um, an ANR officer, um, trade union official for um, Basra and the Social Workers Union. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Fitzpatrick. I um, am an advice and representation officer, trade union official for Social Workers Union um, and uh, Basra. Um, I um, tend to cover a lot of the London and South East area. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, lots more to say, Lisa. That, that'll come. Mm. Um, so I'm going to start us off with with a, a first question, which is just really basically, what is disability discrimination? OK. Um, we're happy for me to answer that one, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, so in terms of disability discrimination, I think um, it's probably helpful to give an overview of, from the, of the, the legal aspect of, of what is classed as a disability for a start. So um, the Equality Act um, covers disability and um, under the Equality Act, uh, it's discrimination for anyone who has what's called a protected characteristic to be treated less favourably, basically. Disability is one of those protected characteristics that's defined under the Act. Um, so the first thing that I think is important to highlight is that, that I suppose the definition under the Equality Act of what actually constitutes a disability. Um, some conditions automatically constitute disability. There's a list in the Equality Act um, on the top of my head. Cancer is one of those conditions. If you have cancer, you're automatically classed as having a disability and you don't need to meet, meet the, the legal definition in the Act. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of other conditions that, that are the same. Um, but in terms of if you're, you're not on that list of conditions, and it's not an extensive list, so more often than not, our, people aren't covered by that list. Um, the first test that has to be met is that the condition or the disability you have has to have, have lasted or be likely to ask to last for at least a year. Um, so a lot of chronic conditions would would fall under that category. And the second one is the more kind of subjective element for that, which is that um, it has to have a significant or substantial impact on your day to day functioning. Um, so you'd need to demonstrate that, that your disability does have a significant impact on how you would be able to function on a daily basis compared to a person who didn't have that disability. So that's how you'd effectively meet that test. Um, and then when we look at the discrimination side of things, if, you, if your class is having a disability, um, it's then unlawful under the Act for you to be treated in a, in a less favourable way because of your disability. Um, and so that could include, um, you know, derogatory comments from from a manager, for example, in a work environment or from colleagues. But also under the Equality Act, um, there's a, a duty on a, an employer to make positive, take positive action if you have a disability. So to make what's classed as reasonable adjustments um, in the workplace to enable that person who's got a disability to work in line with their non-disabled colleagues. A very typical example would be ensuring that there is wheelchair access to a building where an office where, where someone who uses a wheelchair would be working, for example. Um, but there are all sorts of different adjustments that can be made um, dependent on what that person's disability is. And the employer has a legal duty to, to consider reasonable adjustments and make what's classed as reasonable adjustments to enable that person to, to work. And if they don't, that would be classed as disability discrimination. Thanks for that, Laura. That was a really good and clear explanation. And that takes me on to the next consideration that I had, which is really, in your experience as trade union officials, how effective is the legislation we have in place to protect the rights of people with disabilities in their workplaces? Uh, I'll, I'll come in there, Callum, if that's OK. Um, 
I think um, it's it's just so important that that um, uh, legislation is in place. Um, and I was casting my mind back to the reasons for the Equality Act 2010 that has now been in place for actually some years. Um, and it came, let's remind ourselves, there's a history. Uh, there's a history of disabled workers, the TUC, the union saying, you know, uh, and this is what we need. This is what, um, you know, the employers were not always treating um, work as well in the workplace. Um, and it came about as a culmination of legislation before. So it was very, very important uh, that, that Equality Act, it's one that it underpins a lot of um, our work, day-to-day uh, -day work now. Um, and I just want to remind you that the, um, the, the, the statutory code of practice, which we do a lot of our work on, uh, what it said was it should lead to real change, more responsible behaviour, better planning, greater confidence that people will be treated fairly. Um, and I have to say, uh, what I will say, we'll go on to talk about in practice how we find that works, but because we have that legislation and that backdrop behind us and that movement behind us, we can confidently go into the workplace and we can make uh, appropriate and reasonable requests. So just sort of, just as a summary really, that is what we do day to day. Um, and our members can have confidence that that is there. Um, it is legislation, it's the law. Um, and therefore employers obviously have to, have to comply with the law. Then what comes about, which we will talk about, is how does that work in practice? What does that look like? What mm -hmm. what can members reasonably ask for? And these are the kind of day-to-day -day issues, which I'm sure Laura will um, touch on as well, is that we um, face um, on a day-to-day -day basis. What I will say, because it is important to be positive, is that we have gone in, we have made those requests on the back of the law, um, and um, I'm going to be really positive here and say it is important that we have been able to make some positive changes for some members in some situations who some who have or are facing very serious health or disability issues. And, you know, we can't stress enough. So we have been able to make some changes. Um, and, and I hope that we will be able to go on today and give you some examples of what that looks like. So I hope that's um, helpful there, Callum. Yes, it is, Lisa, it is. Um, and it, it sort of naturally leads me on to my next question, which is what, what types of discrimination do you see members coming to you to ask you for advice or representation about? It's just really important to cover what Laura said as well, which is, a uh, long-term and substantial adverse, adverse effect on ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. So when we're thinking about that, and when we're thinking about the types and the kind of variations of situations that people are facing, we are looking at a range of physical, um, mental health, and sensory um, disabilities or health issues. And if you think about that, what that is a range, isn't it? It's a wide ranging. So obviously we'll go on to give you some examples. Um, uh, I mean, what's really, and, and, and along with that, what I'd like you to think about generally is, what is the day-to-day -day work of social workers? What skills do they need? What are they doing? How, how do they use their physical and their mental health, if you like, to do their job? Um, so I'm going to, one of the things that really interests me is about the use of computers um, and, and the how often, uh, particularly post-COVID, we are using computers uh, for virtual meetings, for databases, for updating reports, uh, for supervision sometimes. It's the basis of the work. So if, for example, you've got a member who has a visual impairment, and we have, we have had, then they are going to face potentially some significant issues. So that's just a, you know, an example of the, the, the types and the range, but I'm sure we can go on to give you more. I think um, 
Lisa gave a good example there in terms of um, members with visual impairments, and I know I've represented uh, members with, with visual impairment myself. One of the most common ones that I've come across since doing this job, and I've been doing it for a while, and, and I think most frustrating ones um, is quite often we've represented members who have had dyslexia um, mm. and have not had the equipment that they need put in place um you know that whatever adjustments they need when they've started work um and then have inevitably um then then it's led to them struggling with perhaps keeping up to date with case records keeping doing an assessment at the same speed as their non-dyslexic colleague you know has been able to do because they haven't got the adjustments in place um and that's that's quite a frustrating one for me because it's i think it's quite an easy solve you know um and it, it but but it's one that we see quite often particularly we've seen quite a few asye students kind of well not students but you know i mean asye social workers go on to start doing their asye they've got a new caseload a new job and they're having to do a portfolio as well and there's no dyslexia equipment that, that's needed for them to be in place or adjustments that are needed to be in place and then they start being told that they're failing their ASYE and, and, and that's where we kind of step in and support members with that and raise those as issues, um, you know, insist on the adjustments being put in place, etc. And we have seen, I've had a couple, um, one particularly frustrating one where um, a member had dyslexia, had the access to work assessment, been recommended all sorts of adjustments and before they were put in place, this person's put on an improvement slash capability plan and all of those issues regarding their performance were related to clearly related to the issues with the dyslexia and again we were able to, to successfully challenge that but it's that that's one that we get quite often i think in our team yeah. that's quite a frustrating one um, but it's just to give you an example of the kind of things that we we deal with and we we represent people with and we would always encourage people to come to us quite quickly if they start seeing that their equipment isn't being provided or the adjustments aren't being made because the sooner we can get those things in place the less likely we are to have issues kind of further down the line okay hear what you're saying so so you're talking about invisible disabilities really that that might go unnoticed quite easily uh which is becoming more commonly spoken mm -hmm. about rather than you know that the whole concept of disability meaning that it's quite clear that somebody's physically disabled or they've got a, a severe learning disability you know, these are these are matters that may well be overlooked or have been overlooked historically. You see, within each uh, area, if you like, that, that say, for example, physical disability, you then have such a range of conditions. So um, I'll get some examples. So um, what what we know about our profession is that it is one of the uh, underpinning it is high levels of stress and overwork um, or heavy workloads, I should say, uh, which given the current climate is not improving. Um, and so what we have from that is lots of issues about health, health prevention, what employers can do, the fact that there's sometimes early triggers. So the stress symptoms kick in. Uh, I'll give you some examples. These, these are, you know, everyday occurrences for Laura and I. So a member would be starting to have headaches, um, uh, other physical symptoms um, and uh, fatigue. Um, and then um, the early triggers are there. Uh, sometimes they will uh, respond, sometimes they will um, not seek medical help until it's far too late. So a couple of our examples. So the reason I mention it under disability discrimination is because what happens, we must remember there's the health category um, uh, under this umbrella. Um, and so what happens is people become, can sometimes become so much iller um, because, because of the work, because they didn't seek help soon enough. And because sometimes the employers are not noticing early enough or not supporting early enough. Um, so the, 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 some of the types of issues we might have had are uh, workers who come to us then with blood pressure problems um, uh, that they start having potentially, you know, heart conditions, um, and then there's all the other conditions that can can happen because of stress, you know, diabetes and things like that as well. Um, so I suppose just in relation to that, 
um, what we then may see, and Laura's touched on it, is um, lots of sickness, reoccurring sickness, um, and it goes on and um, the pattern get, can get worse. So it's important, what we'll come to, I'm sure, is um, to um, plan and, and, and get assessments regularly um, and get the help that people need as soon as possible. Um, so it, and it's just about the range of, of, of health conditions that we're working with. So there's an extensive spectrum of, of impact almost you might describe uh, that, that people experience individually depending on their disability and their needs and actually how the employer supports them with it. And that takes me on to the next question that I've got for you, which is, you know, say, for instance, a social worker has been off long term sick uh, with a condition. It might be pre-existing, um, might have continued and, and lasted 12 months. And as you earlier described, Laura, then be defined as a disability under the Equalities Act. Say they've been off long term and they're coming back to work and they're entitled to have reasonable adjustments. What might they look like for, for a social worker coming back to the office? I think it depends very much on what that condition is um, and whether it was something that the employer knew about before and hadn't put in place. That There's all sorts of kind of um, additional factors to that. So, I mean, for example, if somebody has um, has been off sick for a while and whilst they've been off sick has been diagnosed with a condition, um, a long term condition, chronic fatigue syndrome, for example, or something that would impact on their, um, I mean, one that we've had come up quite recently over recent years is long COVID. Um, that's kind of some we've, we've supported some members who've had that diagnosis of long COVID. And of course, one of the, the major symptoms of that is, is you know, fatigue, um, breathlessness. So I think if someone's coming back from being off sick for a number of months with long COVID, we would want to be having the conversations with the employer and the member. How do you think you can manage those symptoms? Because it is about reasonable adjustments as well. The employer, the social worker still has to be able to do their job uh, and it's about putting the right adjustments in place to enable them to do it. So. For example, there might be conversations with that member about do you think coming back part time would be a, a better option or compressing your work hours over four days so that you get a day of break? Or do you think a longer day with a longer lunch hour might work for you or starting later, finishing later? It really depends on how that person's symptoms affect of their condition affect them. Um, and, and what we tend to do is ask that the employer does an occupational health assessment because then the occupational health assessor can make recommendations. But there's also an organisation called Access to Work that, that the member can refer themselves directly to and they do a more thorough report on what the person's disability is and how that impacts on their daily life and what recommendations they would make to the employer. So looking at something like long COVID, um, you might be looking at examples of enabling the employer to take more regular breaks throughout the day, like I say, reducing that work hours, having an extra long phased return back to work with regular review periods so that they can actually ascertain how being at work is going to impact on their condition because somebody might think well I'm going to struggle to do five days but actually if they did if they go back to work and gradually build it up they may find they can so it's about having those conversations with the employer what would work for the, the the person and what would work for the employer in terms of getting this person back to work starting off going back part-time building it up to full-time going part-time permanently changing your hours permanently those are just kind of particular examples of, of one condition but it would depend very much on what the condition was someone with a physical um disability a visual impairment for example would need very different adjustments to someone who's got long covid um and it's about getting those assessments in place and and getting the support the employer to put the right the right things in place to support that person in the workplace just a couple of practical things around what what kind of laura's been saying there um uh, for example, the range and, and what people um, request or need is yeah absolutely related to their health or the, you know, their disability. So some examples of that could be um, we we work with members where <clears throat> um, <clears throat> sorry um, where they have um, um, dyslexia. Sometimes they've gone prior to the job or during the process 
learn more about their dyslexia. That's also quite an interesting, that's quite common. Um, and I think people worry about that. Sometimes people have found out much later in their working life. Um, so they will, um, they can, you, people can go and get uh, assessments. Uh, there's also, we, we mustn't forget that, you know, the great organisations out there, such as the Dyslexia Association, the helplines that can give specific advice to people. Uh, but they might, for example, <clears throat> because of an assessment with occupational health, access to work, they might um, have adapted keyboard, uh, text-to-speech software, Dragon software is just an example of what's out there. Obviously, we're not experts in the uh, in the software field, but the recommendations will come. Um, and there are some real um, issues around when people come back from long-term health conditions. Um, I've worked with, um, in the past, people who've had cancer, returning with cancer. And as Laura said, there will be need to be discussions about um, fatigue starting slowly building up. And uh, we mustn't forget the issue of confidence, um, of, of what it's like to be off long-term sick with an illness, to be away from social work, away from your team, knowing that you're not there, um, you know, at, at the coalface. And uh, the impact that that has on people's confidence, it takes some time. Um, I'll just mention briefly myself, I had a, a total knee replacement before Christmas last year, it took me quite some time to recover. Um, uh, I myself understood what readjustments actually mean in practice, and they are a lifeline uh, to being able to return to work and to be able to function. So they really are important. And, and to, what I wanted to convey today was some of our employers are very good and will listen and do hear. Um, I had one that I'm thinking of who took uh, the members' issues very seriously and they put a good phased uh, return plan back uh, in place. Um, it was very reasonable. It gave the member time to get back to work. Um, and there was also discussions about what was the appropriate role for her. Sometimes that can happen. If you're on the front line with you know, the, the nature of the work, sometimes, not always, and I'm not saying it should be, everyone's different. People have to reevaluate, consider where they're at, what they need because it's also about well-being, you know, what's best for our, our members' well-being. And sometimes there can be a period of crisis where people have to think, you know, where am I now? What, what do I need? And that's really quite interesting as well, a period. So it's, it's a very uh, transitional point uh, for, these, for our, some of our members who have had life-changing um, illnesses. Um, and I think the role that we can play with the employer is really significant at that point. Thanks, Lisa. And I imagine um, I'm saying this to both of you that that those arrangements, those plans, need to be quite fluid uh, and and reviewed quite regularly. Yeah, that's right, Callum. Absolutely, yeah. the review process is is just as important uh, as as the bit implementing it. So what so what we do, we play a really good role, I think, in saying to the employer, okay, this is great. We have the plan recorded. Uh, there's something called a disability uh, passport, which we can talk about today, where you can record the needs and you can um, and, and we've passed on that to some employers who haven't had it. Uh, so to so to prevent the person, the member, having to keep explaining over and over again what their condition is and the impact. So we have something available within the service that's been developed, and some local authorities have developed it already. Um, so um, yes, um, that what that's yeah. Yeah, and what I would say well, as that, well. That seems... I was going to just say in, re in relation to that. I think what you have to remember is quite often when we're representing people, they have it's a it's a recent diagnosis of their condition. So so the review is so important because they actually don't necessarily know how that they're still getting to getting to grips with how their disability is going to affect their life and what they can and can't do and whether it's going to change over time. Um, whether that whether they will be able to kind of work full time or what adjustments are needed so that's why the review is so important because until somebody knows how their disability affects their day-to-day -day working life they can't clearly say well you know I know I need this this and this they may have some idea but actually the review is 
really important in establishing well how has this gone is there anything else we need to be in, put in place or do we need to change what's already been put in place yeah and with the review um the role of the managers i found is absolutely pivotal and key and i know there'll be some managers listening to this um their approach um their understanding um uh, uh that, that, you know coming away from performance management and, and 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 working with the employee our members um with a with some understanding and the best outcomes have been where that has happened and i'm going to also say uh hr um if we get a uh understanding uh member a, a hr person it absolutely drives the whole thing so it's like a, a bit like a, um, a multi, you know, multi-agency response, isn't it? Now, if you get a good response from from the people that are involved, it, it can work. And Laura's absolutely right. It can take time, confidence. Um, I worked with someone who had cancer, um, who was had had a really uh, uh, more than one person, but had had a really really traumatic time. I literally had re recovered from very serious illness, didn't know if they would ever return to work again. Uh, and in fact, the employer, there's just basic things, very simple things they can do. Uh, in this case, the person, there was issues around to uh, toileting and, and practical things like that. And the employer managed to make arrangements uh, that enabled that person to be more in the office space than anywhere else and to have access to uh, what they needed. So it's, it can be just basic, doesn't always cost lots of money. Um, so yeah, the planning, the review process, absolutely key. That sounds like a really ideal descriptor of when things have gone well and when employers are, are on board with um, working with you to support members and social workers to get back to work. Um, how do you actually deal with the challenges that you experience with employers when they behave less reasonably or when they're not compliant with their legal responsibilities? I don't know. Shall I answer? That? I'll start yeah, the answer on, to Laura. this one. Yeah, 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 you <laughs> um, do. I'm sure, you'll, I'm sure you'll have things to say about it yourself. Yeah. It, it, again, the, the approach would depend on how the employer is behaving. And I do think it's important, as Lisa said, we have had some really good employers that have actually you know, invited us to meetings, but the member has said, because the member's been entitled to a representative, but the member said the employer's been great. You know, we've just been there to support, basically. But we do, of course, have situations, as I touched on earlier, where clearly the employer is failing to put really, sometimes really basic, simple adjustments in place that really isn't going to inconvenience them or be of much of a cost to them, if any, um, and they're refusing to do it. And I think at that point, you know, we always try to work with employers if we can to try and get the best for the member. I think I'm always very mindful when we go into employers, if I go in all guns blazing, which I'm prepared to do if needed, get, don't get me wrong, but actually if I go in, that that person's got to carry on working there and have maintain those working relationships. So it's about kind of trying to keep those going. But actually, you know, if we have situations where there's blatant discrimination, like I say, like someone being put on an improvement plan when they haven't put equipment in place for dyslexia, it's like, well, this needs challenging, you know, from the outset. And, you know, in, in capability meetings, we will make, raise those issues in that. If someone's saying, well, we're concerned about somebody's ability to keep on top of their caseload, as officers, we would say, well, actually this person clearly has a diagnosis of you know, dyslexia. I'm giving you the example, it could be another diagnosis and you haven't put the recommendations in place. So this needs to be stopped, this process needs to be stopped until you've got those these things in place. Um, sometimes employers will will listen to that and take a step back and think, well, actually, you know, perhaps we've we've messed up here and put the equipment in place. Um, sometimes we need to take a more forthright approach and we'll encourage members to raise a grievance about the the issue um, in terms of the discrimination they're suffering and raise it because then you're raising it formally, and the employer has to respond to it formally. Um, and one of the things I tend to try and highlight to employers politely but but clearly is that. You know, sometimes I think you get an attitude of, of an employer thinks they're doing a, somebody a favour by putting something in place for them because they have a disability. 
actually you're not doing that person a favour, you are legally required to do it. And it's a legal requirement for you to consider and make appropriate reasonable adjustments. Um, and if you don't, you're breaking the law. So it's about kind of putting that on the employer if we need to, that this isn't just something you're doing to be nice. It's not a it's not, it's not a favour, it's not charity, it's actually a legal requirement for you to ensure that disabled employees can work on, on line with, in line with their co non-disabled colleagues, really. So um, they're, they're the kind of things we will do in terms of raising those issues. Yeah, just to add to that, yeah, absolutely. We 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 have had members who are, are where there are multiple processes in place. So I have given you some positive outcomes there, but we also have, for example, they may have, have had long term sickness. Um, they then um, the employer may have responded by um, enacting stage one, stage two, a potentially stage three. Uh, absence, ab absence, uh, which can uh, once there are gone through formal processes, which they have to, um, that that can lead to dismissal. Um, you know, potentially members are facing some very serious issues. Um, it's really stressful to go through stage two sickness and stage three anyway. And then, so they may have had multiple issues, sickness. Um, the the illness or disability that they're trying to manage, um, a deterioration uh, um, in their health alongside that. Because what we find, don't forget, is that health and disability issues can fluctuate. There can be good periods and then there can be really, a, you know, a peaks and troughs, if you like, um, uh, in terms of the way members are, are feeling. And sometimes the employers do struggle a bit with adjusting to that. So again, we, we play that role. Um, so um, there can be multiple issues, the sickness absence, and then there could be a grievance that they're taking. Then we could be in an appeal process, uh, 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 appealing against a grievance outcome. Um, and then within all of that, there will be um, a formal record um, which uh, we support the uh, member with, which is of recording uh, all the issues where the employer has not fulfilled or complied with their responsibilities. Um, and ultimately, uh, we would be preparing for some sort of outcome and looking with the member about what their options are for the future, for now and the future, I should say, you know, that they we will hold the employer to account. Sometimes, sadly, I'm going to say the reality is that there have been people who have the where they have just felt too unwell over a period of time. They've had, we've even had where they've had readjustments. They've had reasonable, good uh, readjustments, but they have had to come to a decision that social work or the team they're in or their role they're in is just not um, manageable. And, and that is a brutal reality because of the way the work is. And obviously we're seeking for that to be different and we're campaigning, Social Workers Union is campaigning for it to be different. But that's the climate we're working in. But yeah, it can be multiple processes. Um, and if we get to uh, sickness absence stage three, we are there to represent our members. One thing we haven't mentioned is um, where um, sickness absence is recorded um, and where, for example, we would um, urge the employer under their own policies to include much of that sickness under disability related sickness. Um, and, and, and that can happen. Um, we, we always need to check the policies around it because they do vary a bit, uh, but it, that comes within the Equality Act around the recognition <coughs> of any sickness issues that arise from disability. So, yeah. Thanks, Lisa. I'm just wondering, because sometimes as a team we talk about, um, we we get members that come to us for advice and representation and we recognise that it's too late. And I think you touched on that, Lisa, in terms of, well, they might be at stage two of a sickness performance or management uh, protocol. What, what would you um, say to anybody who might be at a point of just realising that they are affected by a disability and it is affecting how they go about doing their job. What's important for them to do now? Yeah, I mean, if I could come to that one, if that's all right. Um, the other thing is that stage two sickness, we can do lots, absolutely loads. And we've got quite, I've, I can think of quite a few members now 
where we've been in stage two, it's often for quite a long time, and um, where the plan has, has, has been in place, reviewed, and, um, and, and there's been improvement and outcomes. And that, that will follow a health pattern or disability issues as well, of course. Um, but yeah, what's important for the member to consider to, to think about? I think just to give, I think on a just a sort of you know pragmatic level, to give themselves time to to give it time to see if the plans can can work, um, to give uh, to to try and hopefully wherever possible to have a constructive good dialogue with their employer, which we can support and help with. I think that's often our role. Um, to give things a chance and then to um, to use the services there, um, to use our service to really think and mull over uh, what the options are, to try to try and look at readjust, readjustments, look at any alternatives within the employment field, i.e. if they're working in a team, you know, what other options could there be? Um, and I've had a, a number of uh, quite positive outcomes where people have um, I'm not saying everybody should move, but where they've decided that that is uh, an option and the employer has, has, has met them uh, with that. Because don't forget, they don't want to lose good social workers, um, ultimately, and they can't afford to. Um, so um, that is, you know, important. And then I just want to mention one service um, that we do use, um, well, we often um, suggest, which is the professional support service. Um, that is linked to BASWA, um, which is part of the membership, and it's a form of coaching. Um, it's not counselling, uh, which is obviously very different, um, but we often also say to social workers who often are reluctant to seek help simply because they've just not been in that pattern of seeking help themselves generally. That's not for everyone, but that just really utilise your own support networks, you know, um, put some of those professional skills in practice for yourself um, and one of those would be the professional support service who offer coaching and they've played a really key role alongside for some members uh, our work where they really use the transitional points to think about you know where am I where do I go from here um, yeah I would just add to that Lisa just one little thing in terms of if I was to to advise a member on on this issue I would say get in touch with with us sooner rather than later um don't leave it till you've got to the point where you're really struggling or or if an adjustment hasn't been put in place and you know it should be don't leave it for six months because it, it things have then often got into a real mess and actually there's there's limited from a legal point of view and i'm not saying we would always take cases on legally but i think legally you have to kind of pursue things in a court with three months of discrimination if there is disability discrimination so you know don't leave it months and months and months and then get in touch because that that creates it you're often then in a, in a much more difficult situation than you would have been if you'd have got the advice and support initially so if you believe that you're you know you haven't had the adjustment in place and that it's starting to become an issue have that conversation with us sooner rather than later thanks laura um, and I'm going to come on to my last question. So, a bit philosophical, but do you envisage there will ever be a point in time when discrimination ceases to exist? I mean, I'll, I'll come in <clears throat> sort of briefly on that, which is really, um, I think what we would say is that we strive for discrimination for to discrimination to you know to to not be around to not be here, and any improvements that we make make a dent, um, a bit like the um, you know the Stonewall um, movements, the LGBT movements. They just strove for years to for improvements, and we gained. Um, and what I would say is that um, the disability movement has been very strong and powerful. And I just it, the Equality Act is there for a reason, and we need to hold on to it. It is important, and and that's what we work with. Um, and every every a small um, achievement outcome is um, is a, is a is a strive towards. You know, it's a move towards removing some of that discrimination. So I think it's 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 okay having it on paper. It's okay having um, statutory codes and the law. But it's very much how these employers 
are putting it into practice. Um, and I suppose what we would say to that is that we see variation. Um, and of course, the tribunals will redress uh, and should redress. That's their role uh, where there has been discrimination. And obviously from that, um, uh, employers will be seeking to remedy um, uh, this, this discrimination and mistakes they've made. So um, I think, you know, every chink uh, that we make, every every improvement is important. Um, the the actual removal of it i think that's a whole different um question isn't it? it it is i think it's the optimistic um passionate person in me would like to hope that in 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 10 15 20 years time there is no discrimination and we all live in a society without discrimination um i think i'm probably a little bit too optimistic when i when i i think like that but but i do think that that there are positive changes that have been made over the last kind of 20, 30 years. You know, if we think about the difference in some societal attitudes now in comparison to 20, 30 years ago, in all areas of, of the Equality Act, you know, it doesn't just cover dis disability, it, co it covers um, race, it covers um, um, gender, it, it, it covers sexuality. And, and there is a, a marked change in, I think, I, I'm, I have two um, teenage children at school and the school environment in terms of attitudes towards children, you know, children with disabilities in the school and um, children from the LGBTQ plus community at, at school is an entire different, um, different attitude and different place to when I was at school many years ago. So, and they are the young people coming up, you know, in our, in our society. So I'd like to hope that changes have been made and we are striving towards the future is a society where where people are far less discriminatory and far more accepting of of, of everybody for who they are. Um, I'm not sure we'll ever get to the place where there's no discrimination, but let's hope we do. Well, thanks both. I, I think you've made it really clear that we've we've made some progress, but there's still some way to go. Uh, and that we have a better chance of challenging oppression and discrimination when we stand together and we support each other. So I'm going to draw it to a close, the conversation there. Uh, and thanks, Laura and Lisa, for joining me this morning with the Social Workers Union.